they discovered upon their arrival was almost unspeakable. We are all evil in some form or another. I'm not guilty. <laughs> the dead won't bother you. It's the living you gotta worry about. Something if I couldn't keep them there with me whole, I, at least I felt that I could keep uh, their skeletons. Hello and welcome to the Bad Taste Crime Podcast. I'm Vicky. I'm Janelle. We're back again. <laughs> Doing it again. I almost said, I'm Vicky. I'm, no, I'm Vicky. <laughs> no, I'm Vicky. <laughs> we got another great episode for you this week. If this is your first time listening, a special hello to you. And only to you. Just to you. Is this coming out in February? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Happy Valentine's Day. Is it Valentine's Day? To you. <laughs> Anti-Valentines. Well, Bleeding I mean, hearts. It used to be more punk rock than it is. Yeah. It was very much about sacrifice. But this is Literally. not <laughs> This is not a Valentine's Day episode. Damn it. This is a regular old episode. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, we're going to get into it in just a minute. But first, let's head over to the newsroom. Our news this week comes from Byron Township, Michigan. Okay. This story. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. Talk about fuck around and find out. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So the story centers around an orthodontist named Dr. Thomas Patrick Shannon. Okay. okay. So police interviewed him and were asking him about a young girl that he was talking to via Snapchat and talking about, did you ask her for photos, for money, you know, getting at child pornography mm-hmm, charges. Mm-hmm, okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, This is from Fox 17. According to a probable cause affidavit filed in Kent County 63rd District Court, Shannon replied, if it happened, obviously it's all there and I have to fess up to it. I didn't know anything more about that, but some girls are on there soliciting. Okay. Okay. So then he decided to prove his innocence. Oh, Jesus. Okay. He was going to hire his own private forensic investigator to look at his iPhone and iCloud iCloud account Mm -hmm. to prove that there was no child pornography in there. Oh, honey. (laughs) (laughs) The investigator allegedly found, quote, a so large much. amount of child porn. <laughs> of course they did. Yes. Just because you delete it doesn't mean it's actually gone, you yes. fucking idiot. <laughs> so, again, according to the article, this allegedly included photos of minors under the age of 10 and sexually explicit photos of prepubescent and adolescent children. Under 10, you fucking That's creep. Fucked up. Yeah. Okay, full disclosure though, I do think that if you have to be an orthodontist, you are a little bit of a perv or a pee. <laughs> I mean, it's just what? in the nature of that business. Yeah. Why? I always got the creeps whenever I went to my orthodontist. I loved my orthodontist. My orthodontist tried too hard. I was oh. like, mm, I think you're a pedophile. Now nah, my orthodontist. And I was, was like, like don't ever put me under. <laughs> Because things might happen that I don't want to happen. (laughs) That's my ultimate fear when going to the dentist. (laughs) Yeah. Although I did kind of get that vibe from my oral surgeon. See? Mm. (laughs) If you're into teeth, you might be a creep. (laughs) Um, Okay. So they're investigating this case. They keep finding stuff. He's been talking. Basically, they found a bunch of child porn. Um, yeah, he's been, duh. He's been charged with eight felony charges, including possession of child pornography, distribution of child pornography, and using a, using a computer to commit a crime. Um, they're still investigating. He has not. He's only been charged. He hasn't been tried yet. So, uh, but I do feel like they they included the letter that the orthodontist office sent out um, <laughs> on letterhead, darling. On letterhead. Uh, <laughs> Basically, they're just cooperating with law enforcement and dealing with it. Um, so yeah, that's that's pedophilia yes. for you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, Snapchat and TikTok, I deleted from my phone. There's a lot of conspiracy uh, <laughs> happening around, like yeah, Snapchat and TikTok being basically fronts for child pedophilia rings. So. Yeah, and also. 
you know, other issues. Yes. With yeah. Privacy yeah. problems. Yeah. So those are gone. <laughs> we are going to move on. <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying. Maybe we're going to have deleting yes. some apps for the new year. Yeah. There you go. There you go. New year, new apps. Apps. <laughs> we're going to we're doing appetizers <laughs> instead of phone apps. That's my new year. Uh, we're going to move on to Netflix and Kill, where this week we are talking about something I was very surprised about as we record. It's been out for like three days. Okay. But I was super thrilled. <laughs> We're talking Madoff, the monster of Wall Street. Full disclosure, I watched the whole fucking thing already. <laughs> I haven't watched the whole thing, but I have started watching it. You know, I am a sucker. I am just a sucker for white collar crime. I am. And Madoff is one of those that I'm gonna say it ranks a, very high on my list. It's a little long. It is well, it's a little long. I feel like it is a good explanation of everything. Like, mm-hmm all of it for people who might not be super familiar Mm -hmm. with bernie madoff which i think is unfathomable but like uh i also think there's an audience for this kind of documentary that is quite a bit younger than i am and probably yeah doesn't recall any of this yeah i barely recalled some of it (laughs) (laughs) Well, and it's not something that I would have been paying attention to when I was, like, 17. You know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. it just wouldn't have been on my radar. Uh, So for those of you that don't know, Bernie Madoff, he was a big financial guy, worked in hedge funds, had a lot of undercover, off-the-books type work, was forging documents. He was a Ponzi artist. Created a Ponzi (laughs) artist indeed. Oh, my God. The guy just scammed everyone. Customers regulators the government everybody the government everybody <laughs> and he had these two tech guys that were working for him that literally like wrote a program that allowed him to write the stuff he needed into the program on the fly to like yeah. fool people it's crazy it's mm-hmm. crazy they asked for a raise in diamonds <laughs> like the story is wild i just would be kicking myself if we didn't mention this documentary mm-hmm. because you know, I'm pretty sure Madoff was on my top 10 list back when we did that. Like, do you yeah, remember when we so. did like the rankings? <laughs> yeah. The um, ranking. I'm, I, yeah. We did a ranking episode a long time ago. Maybe we should come back to that. Yeah. Maybe we do a white collar specific <laughs> ranking system. <laughs> Don't get me so excited. Dude. <laughs> That's all I have to say is white collar. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, uh, if it has any, if you tell me. Madoff or Enron, like, hey, what did you I'm get for Christmas? Putty, for me, you know, Green, I know <laughs> for Christmas, Janelle got me this <laughs> cool. It's like a paper craft, mm-hmm. like piece of wall art mm-hmm. that is the Enron logo, and it's beautiful. <laughs> and I've shown it to so many people, <laughs> and you and Tiff are the only two who are like, that's amazing. <laughs> Everyone else is like, why? What? <laughs> They're all like, why? And I'm like, how many people went? Enron. But how many people went? What is that? Anyone say that? No. Okay. No. Because <laughs> I know that you also hang out with younger people. It's true. It's true. So, um, I haven't shown yeah. any of them, but they have mm-hmm. seen it and been like, but why the Enron logo? And I'm like, because it's fucking Enron, dude. I don't know. It just gets. Uh, it's it's one of those things. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Check it out. It's on Netflix. It's a fun watch if you're unfamiliar. I mean, except you for the it end, was... it's not very fun when they talk about well, all the yeah. people that got ripped off and the suicides that followed. Yeah. Spoiler alert. Spoiler a lot of people alert. killed themselves. Um, but it's called Made Off the Monster of Wall Street. You said it was a bit long. Did you enjoy it? or did? Yeah, you... it was just a little long. Yeah. I feel like there are parts where they explain things like too in depth about what was really happening to the point where it was like, ah, if you don't, if you're not familiar with financial stuff, it might be like too yeah. much. It can be. I did think they did a pretty good job of dumbing it down to an extent though. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think it was closer to the end is when yeah. things start to get like oh, too yeah. much. And oh, I'm yeah. like, oh, God. <laughs> the, the like general concepts about what's going on. That is one thing that I appreciate because I really, as much as I love this kind of fraud, like, the financial side when mm-hmm. they start talking um like the technical stuff i'm just like i don't understand i didn't even re- remember all the people that like were involved too that killed themselves like i didn't mm-hmm. like not just people that were affected by w- the money that he took from them but people that worked for him his right. family members <laughs> they killed themselves mm, yeah yeah wild anyway that, that part got left out in yes. the news yes. <laughs> if you need a good interesting watch mm-hmm. Don't invest your money ever. (laughs) That's what I learned from it. Same. 
same. Oh, we didn't have life insurance because he had so much money invested. I was like, what? You didn't get life insurance? What? <laughs> That's That was the end for me. I was just like, are people that Mm-mm. always have a backup plan? <laughs> always. Don't believe the stock market is your saving grace. What is wrong with you? <laughs> oh, time and time again, that is proven. I, I grew up with my grandmother who was a baby of the Great Depression. So, <laughs> yeah, you don't do that. <laughs> this is that part of the show where we say content may not be appropriate for our listeners. We'll be discussing some murder. Some things. <laughs> some murder and some other things. Vicky, where are we going? <laughs> We're going on down to Texas, y'all. Yeah. It's, it's always bigger in Texas. Mm-hmm. I've just been, I realized the case I covered last week was from Texas or last time was from Texas. Mm -hmm. And that was not on purpose. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I decided to cover this before I decided to cover that. So (laughs) we are heading down to Texas. This case came to me. Actually, I had, hold on. I have a prop. This came to me from from my mother. Okay. Um, I have a prop. It's kind of a prop. You bring it with and you'll probably laugh. Okay. Oh, yeah. Fuck yeah, AARP. <laughs> it is the AARP magazine. Helen Mirren Goes West. Yes, I just started watching 1923. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> Are, do, do you subscribe to this magazine, Janelle? I, I don't, like but I right did up. accidentally <laughs> get one one time when we first moved into our house. Um, yeah. Um, it's because my grandmother was on our address for a little bit, so they sent us AARP. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fair. So mm-hmm. my mother, who is over 65. Mm-hmm. Retired, yes. <laughs> Retired. Makes sense. <laughs> um, gets ARP magazine, <clears throat> and occasionally she'll see things and be like, I'm going to give you this so you can read this article. Okay. Yeah, it's such a strange magazine, right? It is. And uh, to be fair, most of this has to do with elder things. things. Yes. <laughs> um, some of the things. I recluttered my home, and you should too. <laughs> well, all right. I haven't actually read these. There's the Helen Mirren thing. The Day My Life Changed Forever, Paul Newman, Jennifer Lewis, William Shatner, and Other Remembers. Um, (laughs) Okay. (laughs) You and your bones. What about my bones? Will they always support you? Take our test. (laughs) Is there a literal quiz? Yeah, it's on page 42. Okay, we're going to take the bone test later. (laughs) Break these bad money habits now. Okay, anyway, point is, up here in the corner... There is this little thing called the Texas Elder Murders. Ooh, okay. Okay. Is I it how not to get murdered was not <laughs> instructions. Well, it's an it's, it's a very interesting article and I'll tell you most of my research was based on the article in this magazine. Mm-hmm. Um super interesting. Was not aware that this was happening when it was happening, I think because uh, it was happening in 2016. Let's mm. be real. There's a lot of shit happening what in 2016. What happened in 2016? <laughs> oh, man. Um, I'm trying to put it out of my memory. I've tried to right. black it out, but it happened. So, um, Trying to mend and black yourself. <laughs> today, yeah. <laughs> today, I'm going to be talking about the Texas Elder Murders. I like how you're presenting the magazine the entire time. I wanted, to bring, I wanted to bring it with to be like, listen, I actually... Hard copy. Hard copy copy research research (laughs) happens here. Is there a flip phone on the back of that? Oh, yeah. It's the jitterbug. It's a jitterbug (laughs) ad. Yeah. You get up to 50% off. But this is the jitterbug flip two. And they have a smartphone now. They got to bring back flip phones. This is We are old ladies on this Mm -hmm. podcast also. Mm -hmm. I complimented Janelle on her grandma sweater when she got here. (laughs) It's a good sweater. I love it. I love all the vintage sweaters. Um, Okay. So let's talk about this. I'm going to set this aside now. Elder murders. All right. We got to get into the mindset. (laughs) Prune juice. Um, I'm also going to (laughs) say, just stick with me on this. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a wild ride. Oh, gosh. I've really sort of tried to adjust things into a beginning to end timeline. Okay. Um, And it's a little confusing. So Mm -hmm. just stick with me. Okay. So our story begins with Catherine Sinclair. An 87-year-old army vet who had eventually settled in Pennsylvania with her husband. She had been working in an emergency room when she discovered her husband had cancer, and he died shortly thereafter. She stuck around their house for a little while, but it just, you know, at that age, it becomes a bit too much. You want to be closer to family. So she decided to move closer to her family in Dallas, Texas. Now, if you've ever had... um, 
a family member in like an assisted living or a senior living community and you've looked at some of these places, Mm -hmm. you know, they can get bougie as hell. Yes. I mean, like fancy, fancy, fancy. And the one that Sinclair's family chose, it was called Edgemere, which is even like sort of a pretentious name, Mm -hmm. you know, like welcome to Edgemere. That's yes. Um, Anyway, they boasted condos of up to $1 million for a condo for a condo, Ew. and like a shit ton of amenities. Mm-hmm. In April 2016, Sinclair's niece and nephew, Jane Fold and Dan Propes, had visited her for dinner. They both remember at the time she was totally healthy um, for an 87-year-old, you know, but in perfect health. Um, So when they found out that she passed away only a week later from natural causes, they were like, what the fuck? Excuse me? So then they went to go clean the apartment out and discovered that there was blood on the bed and that Sinclair's oversized safe containing tons of valuables was missing. Suspicious. Fold and Probst went to the police to convince them to investigate it as a homicide, but the medical examiner had already ruled it natural causes. Hmm. Uh, A robbery investigator was assigned to the case, but the turnover at the police department at the time was super, super high. And so it was really quickly just like lost Hmm. in the shuffle. Okay. This is going to (laughs) be a pattern. Ooh, gay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, whether or not they knew it at the time, it was later reported that Edgemere had discovered there were quite a few intruders on the property. And of this bougie place? Yes. The security? With top security, <laughs> don't you know? They didn't always call police or look at the security footage mm-hmm. when they, like, figured out that there was an intruder. intruder. They didn't, like, go back and look at any of it. Mm-hmm. So shortly after Sin- Catherine Sinclair's death, police found a man named Billy Shamir Mirror roaming what a name <laughs> he's from kenya mm-hmm. um shamir mirror at the edge mirror <laughs> <Whoa. Many mirrors. laughs> um so they found shamir mirror roaming the hallways at edge mirror they issued him a formal warning and he was banned from the property okay <laughs> don't come back okay mm-hmm. The following month, 91-year-old Phyllis Payne, who was also living at Edgemere, was preparing for a huge bridge night. Fuck yeah. Bridge, (laughs) baby. She was an active member of the community. She had skipped a vacation with her daughter to, like, go. She had this, like, big bridge blowout. It was a huge bridge (laughs) get-together. The next day, Payne spoke with her daughter, Lauren Adair Smith, on the phone and sounded in good spirits. But not long after... Adair Smith was informed by her brother that Payne had passed away. Hmm. So she rushed home to help with all of the prep- the preparations, including, like, cleaning out the apartment. It didn't take long before they noticed that there were valuables missing hmm. uh, from her mother's things, including pieces of silver and a coffee can she had kept all of her gold in. Hmm. In June 2016, 94-year-old Phoebe Perry was discovered dead in her apartment, determined to be natural causes. Upon further inspection of her home, it was discovered she, too, was missing valuables. Hmm. Two weeks later, police again discover Shamir Mir hmm. roaming the hallways. This time he was arrested and he got charged with trespassing and was sentenced to 70 days in jail, of which he served only 12. Okay. Surprising. <laughs> yeah. Texas. Usually they're a shoot first, ask questions later kind of a situation. (laughs) Right, right. Just a few minutes away from Edgemere was another senior living facility called Tradition Prestonwood. Okay. (laughs) I know these names. Again, very upscale, very bougie. I was looking at pictures of this place online. Like, oh my gosh. So nice. In the spring of 2016, there were a couple large burglaries, specifically one where $3,500 $3,500 worth of jewelry was stolen from 82-year-old Joyce of Bramowitz. Now, police didn't find any signs of a break-in, and Abramowitz thought it might have been the help. She was like, maybe it was one of Always. the maids. Yeah. But on July 18th, she was discovered dead in her apartment and determined to have died from natural causes. Hmm. Again, it was discovered that her belongings, this time totaling $5,000, were missing. Over the course of the next 18 months, eight more residents 
died under very similar circumstances, all with missing belongings. One of these, 83-year-old Leah Corkin, was missing her wedding ring. When her daughter spoke up about it being missing, Tradition Presswood uh, Facility Director Edmundo Sanchez told her that old people misplace things, like maybe you want to check one of the drawers or the cabinets, like just check around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Sure, sure, sure. It's important to note that throughout all of these deaths, police were just treating it as like old people shit, right? Seriously. Yeah, yeah. They, they never took a second look when property was reported, reported missing. They oftentimes did not perform autopsies mm. because they were looking at the age of the deceased and being like, they died from old age, essentially, on everything. Um, they never took photos. They never looked for fingerprints. They never attempted to collect any evidence whatsoever that they may have if the victim was younger. Yeah. Um, a lot of people have sort of claimed ageism in these cases because like, yeah. w- and the poli- and the police have sort of said, well, when you're looking at uh, the amount of like your caseload, right? And you have all these cases coming in. Am I better spent spending my time investigating this young person's death that was kind of unusual or somebody who is living in a retirement facility that appears to have died from natural causes. Why would I waste my time on an autopsy? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, but I feel like the children of these people could have spoken up about that because they ultimately have the say. True. (laughs) True. Um, and as you'll see too, like the facilities themselves played kind of a part yeah. in, they don't want a bad reputations because uh, then people yeah. won't come there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I lost my spot. Which is why I'm just going to become a feral crone in the woods when I get too old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to live, live in a cave. Fucking tree house and, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> not let anyone around. <laughs> build a moat Mm -hmm. (laughs) it wasn't until the death of 89 year old solomon spring which they believe is the only male victim uh, that police became even a little suspicious (laughs) okay (laughs) this is from the aarp article quote crime scene (laughs) photos show his bedroom and bath contained extensive but unexplained blood trails an out-of-place lamp and a piece of wood that would suggest a worker had entered the apartment, although no maintenance had been ordered. Huh, End quote. Interesting. Okay. As with the other deaths, valuables and jewelry were missing from Spring's apartment. But the suspicion ended pretty quickly when the medical examiner listed the death as accidental from the result of a fall. Yeah. And hold on. I've seen See, old this people is, fall before. This okay. is why I <laughs> needed these magazines so that I could mm-hmm. show you the picture that was in it. Like, my grandmother fell a billion times, and nothing happened to her house. Now tell me. That is a lot of fucking blood. Does that look like an accidental fall? There's a lot of splatters. There's a lot of drips. Mm -hmm. It goes from a trail of, like, small to large puddle. Yeah. It's all on the floor, too. Yeah. And I realize, like, when you get head wounds and stuff, like, those do bleed a lot. But, like, even for that, that's, like... You would... It will... He fell. What did he hit his head on? If he hit his head just on the ground. Right. Or like on the, the edge of the... But I don't... I mean, that's that carpet. still is like... That's carpet. Isn't there a... That's carpet and then like a tile. Counter? Oh, no. And yeah. And So all the blood's on the carpet. Mm-hmm. There's a little bit on the tile. And there's what looks like a lamp that has blood on the corner of it. Um, like it, it could have been used to hit somebody in the head. Mm. And then right next to that is... What looks like a night stand, hmm. a bedside stand. Accidental. But the the lamp is perfectly in the corner. Hmm. Upright. Hmm. Very interesting. Hmm. Very interesting indeed. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, moving on. <laughs> on October 8th. 2016, Norma French had returned to her residence at Tradition to watch a football game. Uh, And after I had finished, her daughter Ellen French House attempted to call her but didn't get an answer. So she requested a welfare check. When police and paramedics arrived at the house, they discovered that French had died. When it was discovered that her wedding ring was missing and according to her daughter, French House uh, 
she said that it looked like it was forcibly removed. Mm. Um, she notified police and a detective was assigned to the case. Police questioned Sanchez, the director of the facility, who mentioned the other re- recent deaths, but like literally did not express any concern about these valuables being missing or the amount of residents that were passing away, which was higher than normal yeah. already. Yeah, because they didn't even note it in their report. Like the police did not know any sort of concern in their mm-hmm. <laughs> in their report. French House had received a tip that one of the paramedics may have taken it, which sort of shifted the investigator's view from he decided instead to launch a cr- an internal investigation instead of a criminal investigation. Mm-hmm. Okay. All of this is happening. And just a week later, 87-year-old Glenna Day was found dead in her apartment at Tradition, the same facility. They claimed, the medical examiner claimed that uh, she had fallen ill and, like, passed away after suddenly falling ill. This is, again, from the AARP article, quote, Kerr, who was Day's daughter, found it strange that her mother would rest atop her fancy $400 bedspread with her hands and smock still stained with paint. She would never have laid down on it on it like that to take a nap, said Kerr. It just wouldn't have happened. But like other victims' daughters, she was in shock. Her lively mother had gone dancing the night before she dies, and she knew nothing about tradition's crime wave. Mm. Okay. So flags are going up to the yep. kids, I would say. <laughs> For the sake of time, we're going to skip ahead a little bit. Okay. Um, but just so you know, like by the time 2016 was over, tradition had mourned eight residents in total. Mm-hmm. In addition to the three at Edgemere. Okay. Okay. It was an all-time high for um, tradition as a facility. In November 2016, a tradition staff member called police to report an intruder. Mm. But by the time the officers made it to the facility, the intruder was gone. He was described as a black male, 5'10", 180 pounds, dressed in a clean suit, carrying a satchel. It was also noted that it wasn't the first time that this particular person had been spotted on the property and he was going around telling people that he was there to check their pipes for leaks. Mm. It wasn't until December 2016 that residents were notified by tradition about intruders entering the building. So it was like six months later. How are they getting into the fucking building? I don't know. Where's the security? In the meantime, police continued to pursue the EMT staff in relation to the French case. Oh, my God. Yeah. So between October 2016 and September 2017, it appears the unusual deaths and burglaries sort of like stopped for a little while. But on September 2nd and 17th at Parkview in Frisco, Helen Lee and Marilyn Bixler were both found dead both deemed from natural causes, both had jewelry missing. Mm. Again, from the AARP article, quote, in October 2017, a well-dressed man knocked on the door of Kay Lawson's apartment in assisted living section of Parkview, claiming he was there to check for leaks. Once inside, the man attacked her, attempting to smother her with a pillow. Lawson began to pray, believing she was about to die, according to an affidavit. As the attack- attacker helped himself to her jewelry, the resourceful 93-year-old played dead and managed to press her medical alert button, which activated an alarm and summoned 911. Hell yeah. <laughs> and she was Life able... Life alert. <laughs> and there... You know what? This comes up a lot because they are like... Either the life the the life alert button was out of reach or had like fallen off as this is happening and they don't have time to press it or what, but like comes up a lot of these people have medical alert buttons Mm -hmm. it's a good idea um so lawson was able to provide a description to the police we're going to skip ahead a little bit more um between october 2017 and december 2017 three women at the upscale preston place retirement community 84 year old minnie campbell 79 year old diane delahunty and 93 year old mammy del mia were all found dead all deemed natural causes all had valuables missing okay Just before Christmas in 2017, another resident back at Tradition was found dead, 90-year-old Doris Westerman. On New Year's Eve, 81-year-old Carolyn McPhee was found deceased in her home. Then in January 2018, 76-year-old Rosemary Curtis and 87-year-old Mary Sue Brooks both found dead. 
Back at Preston Place in March 2018, 80-year-old Martha Williams was found dead, missing valuables. Okay. This is just like, boom, boom, repeating, boom. Repeating, repeating, repeating. Yep. Mm-hmm. Three days later, 81-year-old Miriam Nilsson had left her door unlocked after having just received a grocery delivery. A man came to the door saying he was maintenance but didn't give any identification. Being suspicious... Nelson grabbed her phone. She like let him in, but grabbed her phone and sat and in her recliner and like watched him holding her phone while he did whatever he was doing. Mm -hmm. After a few minutes, the man left and Nelson still decided to notify the facility of this very suspicious dude. Mm -hmm. Two days later, Nelson was found dead and missing $11,000 in valuables. You have to remember like the people that are staying in these places are all wealthy. Yeah. people mm-hmm. uh nelson was a bit different though because she had actually reported a suspicious person mm-hmm. and so police actually began investigating her death as a homicide from early on but it was only because she had reported seeing a, sus- a suspicious person they looked for the missing jewelry they dusted for fingerprints they did all the stuff they should have probably been doing from the beginning Um, But the facility still didn't feel compelled to let the other residents know that this was happening at all, (laughs) (laughs) which is crazy. Uh, Of course. On March 18th, 2018, 82-year-old Anne Conklin died after just uh, returning from walking her dog. When her body was found, the dog was still on its leash next to her body. On March 19th, 2019, 91-year-old Mary Annis Bartell heard a knock at her apartment door. When she answered, a man told her he was maintenance and forced himself inside of her apartment. He told her to lie down on her bed before smashing a pillow on her head and chest so hard that she blacked out. Bartel's door was found ajar only minutes after the attack and friends immediately called 911. At the hospital, this I found kind of interesting, at the hospital, Bartel began telling the story of what happened about the stranger wearing green gloves, coming to the door, being attacked. And she's telling this to the police and they were like, she hit her head. She's just confused. There's no way oh that this happened. God. That was, that's the There's part that no I'm like. way that this happened. Yeah. And even her kids were like, our mom's like a straight shooter. Like she does not make up stories like this. this is, that would be super unusual. And the police were like, nah. She hit her head. She's confused. She's old. She doesn't know what she's talking about. Just this is what you can prepare for in your 80s and 90s. Yeah. I've already decided I'm going to go into a Swedish death pod before I get to my. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Been decided. So Bartel is at the hospital. Meanwhile, police had received a report of a man loitering in the Preston Place parking lot. They ran his license plate and discovered that it was this guy, Billy Shamir Mir. Hmm. Uh, they also discovered that he had an outstanding warrant for public drunkenness. Okay. <laughs> and decided to, like, that was enough cause to track yeah. him down and arrest him. Mm-hmm. While we look at all this other stuff. So on March 20th, 2018, police followed Shamir Mir into a parking lot where he was surrounded Uh, Before arresting him, undercover officers watched as he disposed of a reddish-orange jewelry box. Interesting. Upon arresting him and searching his vehicle, not only did authorities find jewelry and heirlooms in his car, but they (laughs) they also found immigration papers... That belonged to 81-year-old Luthi Harris at an address that was not far along, not far away, along with some house keys. Hmm. When they went to check on this woman, she was discovered dead in her oh, home. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that's a direct hel- hello. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little background on, on Billy Shamir Mir. He was born in Kenya, immigrated to the United States. He did have a few previous convictions for DUI and assault on a former girlfriend. When he was arrested, Shamir Mir continuously proclaimed his innocence and attempted to sort of explain away all of these things in his possession. Uh Yeah. (laughs) They did some investigating. They found that he was, like, um, selling these things online and, like, posting them online to be sold pretty quickly after all of Mm. the uh, murders happened. So, like, he didn't necessarily have all this stuff in his possession anymore, but... Um, there's video evidence of him following some of these women out of Walmart, um... 
posing as a worker in various assisted living facilities and senior facilities. Yeah. So Shamir Mir was indicted on 22 murders in total. Yikes. Later, um, he was accused of an additional six after in a, um, a civil suit. There was an additional six that he was being uh, sued for. Shamir Mir's first trial for the murder of Luthi Harris took place on November 15th, 2021, but was declared a mistrial after an 11 to 1 deadlock. What? Oh, yeah. Texas is one of those states. You got to have a full 12. What? Oh, yeah. <laughs> one person didn't fucking believe it? I guess. Oh, my God. Ew. <laughs> the retrial began in April 2022, and he was found guilty. A second trial for the murder of Mary Brooks took place in October 2022. He was once again found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. He's currently serving two life sentences. The remaining charges were dropped, much to the dismay of the rest of the victim's families. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of the story. This one I found interesting because, I mean, we look at a lot of these cases where police sort of drop the ball in Mm -hmm. investigating. Uh, I don't know that we've talked about one necessarily where they've dropped the ball in this way, where it was like because of the age of all of the victims. Yeah. I mean, there wasn't a victim that was under 80, I don't think. And you would think because they were rich, they would care a little bit more because it's right. Texas. <laughs> Especially when you have people coming and saying they're missing like thousands of dollars in valuables. Like, why would that be missing from if they died from natural causes? Like, why? Yeah. You know, and a lot of it is chalked up to like, oh, the elderly are forgetful. They like to move things. You know, she's confused and doesn't know what she was talking about. She wasn't attacked by somebody. Sure, like, sure, sure. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. It's just a very interesting um, lapse, yeah. like, th- in this manner of of finding these people. But also, you're totally right. Where the fuck was the security in these places? Like, what are these people paying, paying for? You're paying all this fucking money for what? A yeah. golf cart? Yeah. <laughs> and the fact that the facilities refused <clears throat> to, like, say something to the residents for a very long time. There that was doesn't surprise me. <laughs> there was a point where, um, towards the end of his killing spree, mm-hmm. where some of the kids of these victims that had um, been killed got together and put up posters that were like there's this guy coming to people's doors saying he's a maintenance man don't open the door Mm -hmm. to let the elderly residents of the community know and somebody came back behind them and took them all down so like i mean the fact that there was active measures to like making sure people know you know that's just i'm not surprised (sighs) i've been in a few of those places and that is precisely why i never ever i would rather be homeless on the fucking streets yeah to be perfectly honest yeah than to live in an assisted living facility yeah i mean i've <laughs> my grandparents um were in them the ones that they were in were pretty nice i mean it wasn't like anything crazy they were nice staff was nice everything seemed fine but i realized that's not everywhere <laughs> you that's, know what i mean like that's a it's unfortunately very rare mm-hmm Anyway, so that is the Texas elder murders. Thanks, mom. (laughs) Thanks for supporting my art, mom. (laughs) All right. So. Um, we're staying with the rich people theme. <laughs> oh, God. Rich people and Texas. Rich people and an elder man. So here you go. Oh, boy. <laughs> we're going to be discussing the murder of William Marsh Rice, who was one of the wealthiest men in Texas. Okay. So we're going to go back in the old-timey machine here. Oh, old-timey yes. wealthy. Old yeah, money. Yeah. He's old-timey. Mm. Um, so Rice was born in Massachusetts in 1816, and he was the third eldest of 10 children. At 15, he left school to work as a general store clerk, and at 21, he bought the business. Okay. Damn, already more successful than me. (laughs) Right? In 
1837, there was an economic panic that occurred due to a, a stock market crash. Okay. And Rice decided to sell the business and move to the Texas Territory, as it was known then. Um, uh, it was the Republic of Texas. Oh, so not a state. God. It's okay. the Republic. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> this yeah. This was like outlaw times. Okay? Yes. Uh, Pre-Civil War. So. This is before or after the Alamo? After. <laughs> after the Alamo, before the Civil War. <laughs> um, so he decided to settle in Houston. Okay. Uh, when he arrived, he worked as a barkeep at a hotel. Uh, he kept part of the liquor sales, and they provided a room for him. Uh, he was issued uh, a head right certificate to 320 acres of Houston land, which if you're not familiar... This is how most of the land was taken during the Western expansion. Oh, God. You were – in some places, it was considered, like, free land. And if you just applied for a certificate and paid a small fee, you could go out there. And when they say stake your claim, you literally go put a stake in the ground. Yeah. And said, this is mine. Oh, God. Old-timey shit, man. Right? So he got a certificate for 320 acres. Holy that's Holy a, smokes. That's a fucking lot. That's a lot. Um, soon after he received his land, he received a first-class license for a mercantile business from the city. And on June 28, 1840, he started his business with his partner, Ebenezer Nichols. <laughs> and the firm was an import-export business called Rice and Nichols. Ebenezer Scrooge. Right? That's like the only ever time I've ever heard the name Ebenezer. Literally. I'm like, <laughs> is Ebenezer Scrooge based on this guy? Is there only one person in history named right? Ebenezer? So um, they imported a lot of goods from New Orleans uh, and New York. So they had lots of customers kind of all over the South and the East Coast. In 1841, Rice was offered a gold cup to the planter. Uh, he offered a gold cup to the planter who brought in the first 20 bales of cotton and silver cup for the first five to um, – people who worked for him as okay. kind of like an incentive award. Um, so he was kind of dealing in all sorts of things. Cotton, oil, everything. All the old timey trades. All the things you could think of. Cotton and oil. Um, <laughs> in 1850, Rice married Margaret Bremond. And in 1851, he and other investors established the Houston and Galveston Navigation Company. By 1858, he was the owner of a brig called the William M. Rice, which carried ice from Boston to Galveston during the summers. Oh, man. So now he's getting that into ice, ice. That ice delivery, though. If you think about it, nobody had freezers at this time. I know. And you had to procure ice. <laughs> yes. Rice also served as a director of the Houston Insurance Company, which insured carriers and freight. So very convenient for himself as he had lots of carriers to carry freight. <laughs> Among his land holdings was a large farm on the outskirts of Houston n near Bel Air as well. Okay. So he he had everything. He, he really was, was like a jack of all trades. Everything. Yeah. yeah. In 1859, Rice incorporated the Houston Cotton Compress Company. He was also an incorporator and director of several railroads, including the Buffalo Bayou, the Brazos and the Colorado, <laughs> the Houston Tap and the Brazzaria. Sorry. The Brazzaria. <laughs> he also... Um, was involved in the Washington County and the Houston and Texas Central, as well as a stage line from Houston to Austin. So now he's getting into the big dog stuff, railroading. Yes. At this time, there was Western expansion in the railroads. They were completing the first trans... Atlantic? Transcontinental? Whatever know. the fuck it's called. The one from the East Coast to the West Coast. <laughs> yes. So railroads and oil and cotton were like the massive business. Importing, yes, exporting. Right? <laughs> During this time, he also held land in Louisiana and he owned 15 enslaved people in this property. <laughs> course god damn it yeah i forgot about slavery right still a thing <laughs> fuck um rice represented the second ward as an alderman from 1855 to 1857 and he served on the petite jury and grand jury in harrison county by 1860 he was filthy fucking rich from <laughs> his real estate and personal property um which was valued at seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars at the oh. time which is a lot in today's money <laughs> What is that? Do you know what the conversion is? I don't is? know what it is. What year was it? 1860. And it was how much? $750,000. $750,000. I'm, I'm, I'm saying some mills. 60, a couple of mills. 
to present. Let's see. Who? Uh, yeah, twenty six million. Yeah, sounds about right. <laughs> basically, almost, basically twenty seven million. Yeah, yeah, yeah rich yeah, fucking man. Million. Yeah. Um, at this time, however, he was living mostly in Mexico. He had a Mexican house. The war was going on. And so he did a lot of his business from Mexico so that he wasn't interrupted. Okay. Um, In 1863, Rice's wife died at 31 years of age. And there are varying reports on how she died, but it is thought that she either died from cholera or yellow fever. There was a massive yellow fever spike during this time. Okay. By April 1865... Rice was worth a million dollars in that time period money. <laughs> oh my god, that's so, so much! So just five okay. years later, he was went from seven hundred fifty thousand to a million. He's an old timey Elon Musk. So um, <laughs> he was just hanging out in Mexico, avoiding the Civil War, having so much money. Um, he then decided at the end of eighteen sixty five to buy a home in New York, and he took up residence there for a short period of time. While he was there, Rice married his second wife, Julia E. Brown. On June- oh, that's right. His first wife died. Yes. I was like, oh, my. <laughs> uh, they got married on June 26, 1867, after the wedding, because Houston was enduring its epidemic of yellow fever still for years. <laughs> um, the Damn. couple moved to uh, inside of New York City. And they would occasionally journey to Houston during the winter months for business when yellow fever wasn't an issue. Okay. This marriage was actually really, really stormy, though. And at the start of the 1890s, Elizabeth actually consulted an attorney regarding the possibility of divorce. Oh. She was, like, not having it. She was oh, over it. Oh, no. However, there was a few issues with some wills going on. Uh-oh. Previous to her consulting an attorney, in 1882, William Rice drafted a secret will instructing the executors to pay over to a trust, um, then the governor and a judge, and funds from his estate would then establish William M. Rice Orphans Institute. <laughs> so his wife was okay. going. Okay. His wife wasn't going to get anything. Okay. This is a secret will. This is a secret will. Okay. In. 1891, he found he founded uh, the William M. Rice Institute for the Advancement of Literature, Science, and Art in Houston. He decided to get out of the orphan game and <laughs> instead put his money towards education. <laughs> Educate those orphans. Yeah. Um, the Institute's charter was signed by all the original trustees that he had mentioned in his secret will, except for Rice. On May 18, 1891, it was certified by the state of Texas. Um, the description of the school within his will is really interesting. It describes the school as for the instruction and education of the white men and women of Houston. So um, William Rice was a massive racist. God damn it. <laughs> this school still exists. Oh, great. It is still a college. Great. Uh, it, is, it is Rice College University, whatever the fuck it is mm. in Texas. One of the biggest tech, one mm. of the biggest colleges in Texas. Um, and actually not too long ago, a few years ago, I think they actually got rid of the, um, massive statue of him in the middle of the college Good. because of all of the writing about how it was for the white women and men of Houston yeah. only. Yeah. Um, because guess what? It's not only white people that attend there. So, right. Oh gosh. So in change 18, and grow, Learn yeah, and grow. right. <laughs> in 1893, Rice made a new will. This time, naming executors Captain James A. Baker, a lawyer who often worked for him, William Rice Jr., his nephew, and John D. Bartin. The value of Rice's estate at the time was estimated to be $4 million in 1893 money. Holy shit. He was very, very fucking rich. <laughs> wow. The new will instructed the executors to divide his property into two equal parts – one to be bequeathed to the Rice Institute, the other to be divided into shares and distributed to his wife, Elizabeth Bryce, along with other legatees. Did I say that right? Sure, what sure, sure. Legatees? L-E-G-A-T-E-S. I don't know. Legatees, sure. Sure. <laughs> so the second one, he decided to include his wife. Okay. They Still must a have had a. They must. This one wasn't a secret. Oh, okay. They, they must have had a little bit of a better understanding. Gotcha. <laughs> by 1893. Gotcha. Um, this was also after she consulted someone mm-hmm. to get 
an attorney for divorce. So maybe they made up. Who yeah. knows? But by the early part of 1896, because of her failing health, um, Elizabeth, they moved to Houston because that dry, arid climate is always better for your lungs, or so they say. Um, and on June 1st, she made her own will. In this will, claimed by her attorney, she stated that they were residents of Texas, which is a community property state, and made provisions for her half of Rice's wealth to be distributed however she wanted it. Okay. Okay. So basically in Texas, the wife gets half of the property of the husband. Yes. After this, she was then moved to a hotel in Waukesha, Wisconsin, because she started to lose her mind due to dementia. Oh, no. It is described in many articles that she was, quote, hopelessly insane. Uh Uh-oh. So by July of 1896, she was in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Huh. She uh, died there shortly thereafter, and a new will was drafted on September 26th the following year, um, providing... (laughs) Several of Rice's relatives with money and leaving the remainder of the state to the Rice Institute. So wait, whose will was that? This was hers. That was her will. Mm -hmm. Okay. (laughs) That's unusual. Her husband mounted a court battle to dispute his late wife's claims of Texas citizenship to counteract her previous will. There was a lot of issues. I don't know how wills work in Texas. And I don't know much about the fact, like, you can re- redo someone's will mm-hmm. on their deathbed or as they shortly after they die. Yeah. Um, she was considered legally insane. Yeah. Well, back then, I mean, I'll also say, so. too, like, <laughs> will and, like, probate law is much different mm-hmm. now. It's yeah. way different now. Back then, it was, like, literally the Wild West about... Yeah. I mean, that was when you could buy life insurance policies oh, yeah, on for someone whoever you fucking know. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a little bit of a gray area in terms of what really went on with the mm-hmm. wills, her will specifically. But he wanted to make sure that her her previous will that was basically going to her estate would take half of his and when he died. Um, <laughs> so he mounted a court battle... <clears throat> to um, say that they were not Texas citizens at the time of her draft of her will. Because okay. they technically weren't. <laughs> so they had Texas property. Okay. But her husband's mailing address was still in New York. That's when they were though, living in New York. No, they were living. Oh. They had just moved to Houston. They kept oh. their house in New York. The mailing address was still considered New York, but they were living full time in Houston. <laughs> Gotcha. Rich people shit. Yeah. That's a problem um, I don't have. Yeah, right? <laughs> Remembering which address is my home address. Exactly. So his they had an apartment on Madison Avenue. He considered himself to be a New York resident. Um, and so because of this, he was not subject to Texas law. Okay. Now, he obtained uh, quite a few lawyers. <laughs> One of those lawyers was assisting him. And then his wife's estate had other lawyers. So she had a lawyer named Holt, and he was being assisted by a, another lawyer named Albert, Albert Patrick. Albert Patrick was in um, Houston, and Holt was out of New York. So that was okay. her lawyer that she conscripted while she was living in New York. Um, and then she, he got another lawyer to assist him in Houston because they were going to fight about being a resident of Texas. Gotcha. He tasked Patrick with finding evidence to state that they were living in Houston. So he went to Rice's residence to discuss some things and to obtain some paperwork. Under a false identity, Patrick interviewed Rice. (laughs) So he went over there, said he was somebody else. Oh, my God. That is (laughs) such an ethical no-no. That's like... That will tell you about his character. Wow. That is such Um, a (laughs) no-no. He... Rice stated that he would have not taken this man into his home and talked to him if he knew that he was assisting his previous wife uh, in the estate. So Patrick was attempting to figure out the domicile of Rice and make sure that he could fight for that regarding them being a Texas resident and not a New York resident. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, Patrick was a native Texan who practiced law for several years. 
In his time, he was considered to be a shady character. Concerns about Patrick arose upon the suspicious uh, death of a wealthy fertilizer magnate who sued Patrick for restitution of $5,500. To escape disbarment charges due to misconduct, he moved to New York City shortly, um, and he was successful in escaping disbarment and then moved back to Texas afterwards. Oh, my God. God, what? That's crazy. While Patrick was at Rice's house investigating, he met Rice's valet, Charles F. Jones. The two hit it off. Jones had been working for Rice for years, and the two eventually decided to cook up a scheme to defraud Rice of money. Oh, wow. (laughs) Oh, wow. (laughs) Plot twist. Plot twist. That's Um, not where I saw this going. Right? Right. First, they planned to just forge some checks and cash money from Rice's New York bank account. This eventually snowballed into a scheme to change Rice's will and state that Jones and Patrick was one of their, one of the many beneficiaries listed in his will. Because if you remember, he listed quite a few people. Right. Half of them get, half of the estate goes to them, half goes to the Rice Institute. Yeah. And they are people who are, like, not family members. It's, like, advisors. Exactly. And random, yeah. So not too far-fetched. Sure, sure. I still can't get past this disguising yourself to talk to. Like, it's when we, um, when I was working on my paralegal, like, they do, they hammer ethics home. I mean, like, oh, yeah. ethics is That's a like huge thing. That's, like, the whole thing. point of being a fucking lawyer. Right. And now <laughs> they have it even written in where you can't, like, create fake social media to like try mm-hmm. and talk to like that's even include you know what i mean yeah. it's, so it's just i realize this is a very different time where people just kind of did whatever but oh, yeah like you can make up 20 fake names wow. and nobody would even know you could open wow. bank accounts you could buy cars under fake names mm-hmm. you can make up a damn social security number and no one could check it <laughs> one two three four five six seven eight nine first person <laughs> born here ever <laughs> So um, Patrick drafted a new will and forged it, which bequeathed generous amounts of money to them. And they also put in there Elizabeth's relatives. So they were being a little extra generous. Okay. So to make it seem like he had a change of heart, he put in Elizabeth's relatives, his footmen, basically, (laughs) um, and this additional lawyer. They also noted that in the will, he wanted to be cremated immediately upon his death, um, which would help with foregoing any autopsy. Okay. So this started to turn into a murder scheme. Okay. See, that's where I thought this was going. The defrauding part was not mm-hmm. what I expected. Mm-hmm. They started small. <laughs> okay. But then their eyes got too big for then their they tummy. Were like, let's just go for the whole enchilada. <laughs> let's kill it all. Everything's bigger in Texas. Now, at this time, Rice was 84 years old, and he had turned into a weird curmudgeon old man. <laughs> As he you do. Was, he was on a steady diet of bullion and eggs only. Bullion? It, yeah, it was just that's just soup without anything in it. Yeah. <laughs> it was just fucking and disgusting. Eggs. Okay. Mm-hmm. So broth and eggs. He was just having broth and eggs. He had a very, you know, regimented day. Did the same thing every day. Was still living in Houston. So the first kind of scheme that they were trying was to poison him. <laughs> as you do. As you do. So first Jones procured mercury pills. Okay. And dumped them into Rice's food. This actually made Rice feel fantastic. <laughs> he <laughs> felt like he had extra energy and was waking up and like what? feeling super fucking invigorated. Oh my God. I love that accidentally helping somebody. And it did not make him feel sick at all. I've never felt better in my life. He was like on top of the world. <laughs> the second attempt they decided to mix oxalic acid with powdered ammonia that was diluted in water and given to him in a glass. Okay. That all sounds horrible. This would have to require, like, Jones to be in the room and ensure that he drank the entire glass. But he couldn't because he had this very regimented thing that he did. So he had faith. He mixed it and gave it to Rice and left. Rice never drank the glass of water. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) On September 8th, 1900, a Galveston hurricane came into town and severely damaged Rice's properties. His entire, like, coastal export 
import area was severely damaged. Okay. And then literally eight days later, his cottonseed mill burned to the ground. Oh, my God. He had to use the entire balance of his checking account to repair his properties. So on September 16th, he cashed out $250,000. Oh, my gosh. To repair his properties. So this actually benefited the two people that were trying to murder him because then we see he's starting to take out large sums of money and doing things that are this feels like a and not characteristic right set up for suicide maybe we'll see we'll okay. see <clears throat> on september 23rd at 1900 shortly after 6 p.m when rice was asleep jones saturated a sponge with chloroform made a cone out of a towel put the sponge in the cone, and placed the cone over Rice's face. Jones left the room and waited for 30 minutes before returning. Wait, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> he put a sponge? He saturated a sponge with chloroform. Inside of a cone? Made a cone made out of a towel. Put the sponge cone on, on Rice's his face, face while he was sleeping. And left. And left the room for 30 minutes. Okay. He returned and Rice was dead. Okay. <laughs> so chloroform in large forms, it's an analgesic. If right. it's used to knock you out, it's just like if you have too much anesthesia. Yeah. Um, you will die. Okay. I just the the cone. Mm-hmm. You it's caught to me hold off, it on his face. Which makes sense, mm-hmm. but like you caught me off guard with a mm-hmm. towel cone. I just feel like there would be yeah. an easier way to do it. So that was just to make sure that it stayed over his face. There was no gaps in it yeah. to keep the – because this is a liquid that turns in turns into a gas. Would it, like, fill the entire room? Yes. So oh. the next thing he did after oh God. he the guy died, he opened all the windows to aerate all of the chloroform out, and then he burned the towel and the sponge. Okay. Next, he called the building elevator operator and asked him to call Dr. Curry, which was um, his physician – And finally, he called Patrick to inform him that Rice had died. Dr. Curry ruled that Rice died of old age and a weak heart. Okay. Here's the old age. Old age. And especially with a rich guy. Why would you not look into that? 84 years old. Patrick showed the uh, doctor the cremation letter as part of his will and then took him to get uh, cremated. He showed the undertaker, the death certificate, and the cremation letter. The undertaker said it would take at least 24 hours for the crematorium to heat up to the correct temperature, so there was going to be a little bit of delay. He suggested that the body be embalmed instead. Even though Patrick had forged the letter saying that Rice did not want it to be embalmed, he told the undertaker to proceed with the embalming. So embalm him once it gets up to temperature so it's not you know he's not smelling up the place then cremate him sure so they arranged to have the cremation happen as soon as possible now there was immediately suspicion upon seeing the paperwork that was given to the undertaker after that um there was also another funny thing that happened at the bank there was an alert sent out when a bank clerk noticed the next day that a large check was forged by Jones, had misspelled the recipient's name. Um, It was signed to, supposed to be signed to Albert T. Patrick, but was instead signed to Albert Patrick. Can't even spell his accomplice's fucking name. Now, this is suspicious because literally days before that, he had taken out $250,000, which is almost all the money in his checking account, to save his business. Yeah. So... They decide to telephone Rice's household to get verification, in which they found out that Rice had died the evening before. Bank officials telegraphed Rice's other attorney in Houston, James Baker. He said that that is not correct. There's no reason that those people should have a check. He's not being retained by him. Yeah. Um, So... You know, like, he he had a lawyer in New York and a lawyer in Texas as well. Yeah. I'm actually pretty sure he had a lawyer in every state that he did business in. Right, right. Um, As you do. But the one in Houston was his main lawyer, and he said, that guy does not work for him. There's something wrong. Oh, God. Jones was immediately arrested and immediately confessed. Wow. (laughs) 
He didn't said, even stick to his conviction. He said that he and Patrick were in cahoots to murder Rice. Um, so he implicated his accomplice, Patrick, who was then indicted for murder and forgery. Oh, shit. Okay. Patrick was sentenced to death, spending four years on death row at Sing Sing Prison before having his sentence commuted by Governor Frank Higgins in 1906 to life in prison. What? Now, this is where it gets even fucking more twisted. After his sentence was commuted to life in prison, in 1912, just six years later, he received a full fucking pardon from Governor John A. Dix. Why? Now, I tried to find more info on this as to why it was commuted, but I couldn't find anything. What the? I mean. Not to mention the fact that this governor only served a very short term, not even a full term as governor. It was really? highly suspicious. Yeah. I mean, the the commuting from death to life is not as unusual. You're still spending but time But they're in, in Texas. They are in Texas. Which is but it big is, on And especially at death that time. Row. <laughs> like, at that time, for mm-hmm. sure. The pardon is very weird. So I did not find out exactly what their relationship was. I couldn't find any news articles really about the pardoning. I did find a lot. There's like a sketch or not a sketchbook, a um, scrapbook in the notes of the Houston Historical Society Mm -hmm. who saved a bunch of stuff. But none of it mentions the pardon. That's Um, fucking weird. So he did get pardoned and he... Died in Tulsa, Oklahoma on February 11th, 1940 at the age of 74. That's so... Why did he get a pardon? Oh, my know. God. I want to know that mind-boggling. So now, Charles Jones was given freedom for his um, turning over all the information and confessing <laughs> and, like, implicating Patrick. Well, these, they are both just so lucky. He They're remained lucky. in seclusion in Texas Um until November 16th, 1954, when he died at the age of 79, he committed suicide. Oof. Um, so uh, that is the murder of wow. William Rice. You can still go visit his institute. After he died, his money Is it went... an orphan institute? No, oh. it's, the, it's the educational institute. It's oh. a university. Okay. Um, his money oh, right. actually went back to the uh, one will before the forged one where it was divided amongst the small amount of people and then the rest the half of it went to uh founding that university gotcha yeah wow that's wild twisty and turny twisty and turny well if you're thinking of taking a trip to texas um before you make that (laughs) decision yeah uh why don't you check out this podcast think about your life choices (laughs) Hello, this is Margot D of the Not Fade Away podcast. This is the show that talks about folks from the music world who are no longer with us. We're talking about singers, musicians, songwriters, composers. If they made a mark on the world of music, we will talk about them. Past and future episodes include Jim Morrison, Aaliyah, John Belushi, Kurt Cobain, Tupac, and Jerry Garcia. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts under the name Not Fade Away Podcast and follow us on all of our social media channels as well under Not Fade Away Podcast. And if you have any comments or suggestions for future episodes, send an email to notfadeawaypodcast at gmail.com. Hope you check us out. Thanks so much. Well, this has been another episode of... A rootinous tootinous episode yeah. out of Texas. <laughs> <A> rootinous tootinous. <laughs> uh, do we have... We have stuff to talk about, right? We got something coming up. Something. Something twisted. I'm pretty sure this dark. will come out before that. A dark matter, if you will. Uh, yes. <laughs> we will be a dark matter in March. Yeah. March 4th and 5th. We don't have the exact day we're performing yet, but we will be um, at Side Street Studio Arts. Uh, Tickets will go on sale soon, and they will have the um, entire set up of all of the podcasts that are performing. Our friends, uh, maybe it's Spiritual and Ghostly Podcast, will be there. Um, There will also be lots of uh, art and cool, kooky, weird oddities for sale. Um, It's a two-day festival, so come listen to some podcasts, buy some weird, creepy shit. Definitely <laughs> uh, keep an eye on our social, I would say, yes. for mm-hmm. dates and times and things. Yes. Um, but very excited for our Ooh. very first live show of 2023. Yes. Mm. Not that we do like a ton. But. No, no. We do like <laughs> We do enough. Yeah. <laughs> Not that it's exciting. Mm-hmm. Um I think that's it, right? That's that's all we got. Okay. <laughs> if you enjoyed this episode, you can find more just like this at badtastepodcast.com. 
uh, where we also have links to our Patreon and to our merch and just to some other stuff. All stuff. I don't know. You can check us out on Instagram and Facebook and all that fun stuff. Uh, but for now, our sh- sound and editing <laughs> show's over. Is our, show's over. Say, yeah. show's over. <laughs> our sound and editing is by Tiff Fullman. Our music is by Jason Zakshevsky, the Enigma. <laughs> This has been the Bad Taste Crime Podcast. We will see you in two weeks. Y'all uh, come back now. Y'all come back now, you hear? It was as if a wave of evil washed over this town. We are all evil in some form or another.